Hi, my name is Puyan Darian. I'm an immigration attorney. I'm creating this video today to answer some of the common questions I received during my consultations about adjustment of status for an immigrant spouse. This is a situation where uh, a U.S. citizen marries somebody who entered the U.S. on a visa. So they entered the U.S. with valid inspection, uh, they got married sometime thereafter, and now they, the immigrant spouse wants to apply to adjust their status to permanent residence, which is a green card. Um, for most people who entered the U.S. with a visa, they can do this if they marry a U.S. citizen even long after their visa has expired. There are some exceptions, for example, J-1 visas subject to a two-year residency requirements. Some people who enter on fiancé visas who don't marry their fiancé crewmen, but most people who enter on employment-based visas or on tourist visas like B1, B2 visas, even years after they overstay, they're still likely adjustment eligible if they marry a U.S. citizen. And of course, this is just general advice, um, general information. It's not specific legal advice, so this isn't going to apply to everyone. It's a fact-specific situation every time. So I want to talk a little bit about the process and the documentation that we'll need. The first documentation, uh, the first piece of documentation which we will need is the marriage certificate of the U.S. citizen with the immigrant spouse. Um, typically here in New York, that process takes two or three days, around 72 hour waiting period uh, between the time where you get the license and the time that you can get the certificate. Once you have the certificate, you can immediately apply uh, to adjust status for a green card. And there are several forms which you would file simultaneously in most situations. That would be the I-130 petition for an alien relative, the I-130A spouse supplement form, the I-485, which is the green card form, uh, the 765, the, which is the work permit, the I-131, uh, permission to travel, advanced parole, affidavit of support, which is the I-864, and that, that's a trickier one. And if you're using an attorney, we would file a G-28 as a notice of representation. We would file all of these forms simultaneously, all at once, with all the evidence and the other ev uh, documentation that's required, such as passport style photographs of the petitioner and beneficiary, the tax returns of the petitioner because they're going to have to be one of the sponsors um, if their income is high enough. We'll need the beneficiary's birth certificate. If either spouse was previously married, we'll also need their prior divorce certificates. Um, additionally, we need evidence of good faith marriage, good faith relationship, bona, bona fides, as they say. Um, evidence of this, I like to submit at least initially some photographs of your relationship, of trips, maybe some vacation receipts if you went to an Airbnb one weekend, uh, if you went to a restaurant, some receipts, some photographs of that. Of that. Um, a few months after we begin this process, the immigrant spouse will get a social security number uh, along with their work permit. By regulation, it's 90 days, but it's taking a little bit longer right now for that to happen. But eventually, once the spouse gets their employment authorization and social, it'll be easier for them to open bank accounts and stuff like that and credit cards and get access to health insurance. And once that happens, it's important for both spouses to commingle. you know, uh, put both of your names on bank accounts, put both of your names on credit cards, utility statements, cable bills, uh, health insurance, if you have life insurance, make sure you're beneficiaries of each other. And all of this is great evidence of a good faith relationship. Now don't do any of this stuff just to prove, have an additional piece of evidence for immigration. Um, but if you do do any of this stuff in your life, make sure to save the evidence of it. There's not one piece of evidence that the immigration officer is gonna see as determinative. Like, oh, they have a bank account. For sure, we need to approve the case now. Bank account actually doesn't mean anything if there isn't uh, a realistic transaction history, and it's only one piece of the pie. Um, I've seen officers who reviewed a birth certificate of a child that was born to the U.S. citizen and immigrant spouse, and the officer still wasn't 100% convinced that it was a legitimate marriage. I mean, that was a little bit of a ridiculous situation. If you have a child and that birth certificate 
Uh, that's the best piece of evidence in my mind. But my point is, it's a case-by-case -case inquiry, and they'll look at the facts of every specific case. There are some cases where we just don't have evidence. Um, one of the spouses is still a student, and they're living on campus. They're not even living together. But they have a plan, and they're able to explain it during the interview, and we prepare, and everything works out. Um, by the way, uh, if your marriage is less than two years old at the time that you become a permanent resident, you will only become a conditional permanent resident. And two years later, you would have to go through a similar process to remove those conditions, which could involve submitting additional documentation and evidence, because now you've been married for two years. If you didn't live together initially, you should be living together by now, two years after you got your green card. Um, and you can easily be subject to another interview two years down the road. So it's really important to continue to save any piece of evidence that shows you're living together, that you're sharing your lives together, document everything very well. Don't take photographs or document stuff um, that you're only doing for an immigration reason. For example, don't open a bank account if you're not, if you don't actually need a bank account. Um, because it's not necessary. If it's a real relationship, there will be plenty of ways for you to gather evidence to prove it. And the most important thing really is the way you present at the interview, which is why it's important to you know do a little bit of a practice run, get a feel for some of the questions that could be asked, and just be confident in the fact that it's a real marriage and you have nothing to worry about because it's a real marriage. With that said, of course, if you have a serious criminal history, there are things to be worried about, other grounds of inadmissibility, but I'm saying, you know, if it's a clean case, there's no criminal history, no history of immigration violations, no fraud or misrepresentations, and there's a laundry list of like 50 questions on the green card application form that could be used to disqualify you. But um, for the most part, from what I've seen, where people people uh, are in a good faith relationship, but they go to the interview and they're just they hear all these horror stories, so they start panicking. And what would have been a perfectly fine interview goes downhill. And luckily for me, I mean, here in New York we have some really good officers. So if you just start panicking, I mean, they're pretty good at getting to the bottom of it. Um, I wouldn't worry if it's a real relationship. That's my point. Okay, um, as far as the process goes, it takes around 11 months right now in New York from the day we file everything until the date of the interview. And around three weeks after we file everything, you'll get four notices in the mail um, saying that your petition, your green card, your work permit, and your permission to travel applications have been received and are being processed. Around a week or two later, the immigrant will get a biometrics appointment notice to go provide fingerprints and a photograph at an application support center. And you'll just get a notice that says, show up at this date and this time at this address with this notice and your passport. It takes 15 minutes. You don't need a lawyer to go with you. It's really easy. After that, um, you're either going to get a request for additional evidence if you forgot to mail something or you submitted a birth certificate without a translation or your tax documents need to be updated for your affidavit of support. Um, or if there's no issues, no additional evidence is required, you'll, the next thing that will typically happen is you'll get your work permit approval notice and now you'll even get your social security in the mail simultaneously. And then after that happens, you're just waiting for your interview appointment notice, which is around month 11 right now. I mean, it could be uh, speeding up in the near future, but right now uh, it's May 2018. It's taking around 11 months from filing to the date we receive a notice for an interview. And you and the interview is typically like a month after we get the notice. Now, um, if you've done any research about this online, you'll realize I haven't mentioned the medical examination form. So the instructions actually say that for a one-step immediate relative adjustment of status, we should be submitting the medical exam, the form I-693, along with all the other forms in the big massive package that we mail out with the money order and the photos and the birth certificates and everything. Um, but I don't recommend that you submit the medical examination form. A few weeks after you submit the initial filing, you'll get a letter that says, hey, you forgot to send us a medical examination, but still, don't do it yet. Wait until you get a specific request for evidence for the medical exam. Um, and if it's a spouse-based adjustment, you probably will never get that request for evidence, in which case, once you get your appo uh, appointment notice, you'll have a month before your appointment. At that point, get your medical exam and bring the sealed unopened results to your interview. If you get the 
uh, if you perform the medical examination before, uh, you know, when you're submitting all the documentation in the beginning with your initial submission, there is a fair chance that the app, that the medical form will expire before a decision is made on your green card. And then you'll have to shell out another three or four hundred dollars for a new examination form. So that's just something that you're not going to see on the forms that could be helpful. Um, now a lot of clients ask me, is it possible for me to do all these forms by myself? And the answer is it depends. I mean, um, if you're fairly sophisticated and you have the time to read all the instructions and fill out all the paperwork, yes, it is possible to do by yourself. And in fact, if you just have a couple questions about how to answer certain complex parts of the forms, you can always email or call me and I'll just help you out for free. It's no, no big issue. But I generally recommend that an attorney perform, um, prepare all the forms for you, just because it is a really expensive application. It's $1,760, $1,760 right now, all in, not including the medical exam and not including attorney's fees. Um, I've had some people do it and get denied because they weren't eligible yet or they just failed to respond to something or they used the wrong address and they never received the mail and they lost the 1760 and now it was denied once and now they want to hire an attorney and the attorney is going to charge them a bunch of money and they have to pay the government filing fee again and now it's even harder for the attorney if it, depending on the reason why it was denied the first time. So really think about the risk versus the reward if if it's a super clean case and you're sure of that I mean I recommend at least consulting with an attorney pay the hundred dollar consultation fee to see if there are any major issues that you should be looking out for that's the, my bare minimum suggestion and then if you decide you can handle it on your own do so knowing and accept the risks of doing so uh, I know plenty of people who've done it by themselves and they've been perfectly successful. But it still isn't something I would generally recommend, especially since recently, the, for example, the petition for an immediate relative used to be two pages long. It's more than 10 pages long with the supplement form now. It's become a little bit ridiculous and I feel like immigration officers are finding any reason they can to deny applications. So my wholehearted recommendation is to find an attorney who you trust and I really recommend getting a second opinion as well. With that said, if you take a look at all the stuff and you have any questions, always feel free to email me directly at puyan at dairyandlaw.com or you can give my office a call at 914-885-3961 and I'll always return your call and answer whatever questions you have. If you decide you want to come in for a more personal consultation, that's fine too. Just give us a call and we can schedule a time that's mutually agreeable. Um, I hope this was helpful. I try to go through uh, the most frequently asked questions that I get on a daily basis during my consultations. Um, and if you have any questions, please feel free to contact me. Thank you.